you know, when you say the amateur, and I think of what happened recently with this Pakistani dentist being outed and now facing 33 years, I think it is, of hard labor in a Pakistani prison or a tribal prison, whatever it is they do over there. I realize it wasn't Obama who outed this uh, this dentist, but as I understand, it was Leon Panetta who confirmed a story of his. Does this all relate to the amateur? I mean, w- w- uh, 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 such a tragic error at such a high-level position on the president's watch, or is that too unfair criticism to the president himself? Well, I don't know if he can uh, blame the president for this. Uh, the fact is that the president for President Obama, for almost a year, for many, many months, was being told by the um, CIA that they believed they had Osama bin Laden located in about about Pakistan, that they thought that he was in that compound. And they had a, something like a 70 to 5 percent certitude about the thing. Um, Valerie Jarrett, who is the First Lady's best friend and chief political advisor in the White House. Who you and, say who you say in the book is one of the two real powers behind the behind the, in the in the White House. Oh yes, I think after the president, whom she is a senior advisor to, and the first lady, who she also is a senior advisor to. No, not, no one's had that position since Harry Hopkins and Franklin Roosevelt's administration 70 years ago when Hopkins was friends with both the president and Eleanor Roosevelt. That's been, you know, no one has had this power. She lobbied strenuously for months that he should not send in the Navy SEAL team. Hmm. He has always taken her advice. In fact, he's, he's on the record as saying, I run every important decision by Valerie Jarrett every important decision, even though she has no background in economics, no background in foreign affairs, no background in practically anything except uh, Chicago politics. And on this one case, he did not listen to Valerie Jarrett, and he went ahead and gave the green light for the SEAL team to go in. And this was, I think, his one positive decision in his presidency. I think any president in his position would have had to do the same thing. It's not taking anything away from him. I'm glad he did it. But I think if McCain had been president or George Bush had been president or anybody, given what the CIA was telling them, they'd have to go in and take out this guy and the way they did. But uh, okay, th- thank you for that uh, background. And as you say, it's o- Michelle Obama and Valerie Jarrett who are the real powers behind the White House. Well, I'm not saying that the president isn't the final decision maker. I'm saying that in terms of who has his ear, who influences him the most, hmm. who um, goes, who, for instance, Valerie Jarrett at six thirty every night disappears from the uh, uh, downstairs part of the White House and goes upstairs to the family quarter and has dinner with the president and First Lady and their daughters. She goes on vacation with them. When uh, there are meetings in the Oval Office or in the Situation Room, Valerie Jarrett is the last person to leave the room. She hangs back and has the last word with the president. Why her? What, what's up with that, do you suppose? It's, it's a combination of things. It's a combination of the fact that she's the First Lady's best friend. She hired the First Lady in Chicago uh, when Valerie was working for Mayor Daley and uh, Michelle went to work for Mayor Daley. She uh, has given, she has made the president and the first lady feel that without her, Hmm. they're vulnerable. She protects them. She's the gatekeeper. She doesn't let people in to see the president if in any way they're going to uh, bring a, a conflicting opinion that he doesn't like uh, say things or uh, push an agenda that he doesn't want pushed. She keeps them away. When they go to a foreign, when they go to a city in the, uh, the United States or a foreign country, she tells them who they can see safely. She is um, essentially their radar system. She's the person who is their protector. And of course, she, at the same time, given the fact that she's got 
their ear, she can make them feel that a lot of other people around them aren't as loyal as she is. Yep. And that she's the one and only loyal person, so she is the essential person, the person they can't do without. What is up with the with Ob- in your book? You talk about how Obama split the Kennedy family. What's up with that? Well, as you know, um, Ted Kennedy, through his very considerable influence behind Barack Obama, instead of behind Hillary Clinton, and along with Ted came Caroline Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's daughter, and they uh, portrayed Obama as the second coming of John F. Kennedy. That right. He, that he really was, the, the torch had been passed, the oh, Kennedy yeah. torch had been passed to them. I'd forgotten all about that. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and not only that, but they, you know, Ted and Caroline represent the left wing of the Democratic Party, not the centrist part, you know, which is the Clinton part, but the, the more, the much more liberal, far out liberal part. So... Uh, Caroline went to town and and really went around the country making speeches and comparing him to her father, sure. which was, you know, imme- an immensely important thing for Obama. After the election, <clears throat> she expected, as anybody who did what she did and was so pivotal in, in the race, to get rewarded. And so she wrote a memo to the uh, Obama White House suggesting uh, how she would go about funding education in the administration. Sure. She has, influ- she has experience doing that here in New York City for Mayor Bloomberg. That's what she did for a while for Bloomberg. Never got a reply. Then she sought a meeting with the president. Never got a reply. And this comes back to your, your, your point about, am- I think, you, you tell me if uh, I'm, I'm off base, about amateurism about not knowing how to run the inner workings of, of governing uh, uh, a bureau. Absolutely. But, you know, every president has every day a list of people he should call. This is compiled by one of his aides, you know, one of his political aides. You know, call Joe Schwartz. He raised $250 million for you for the campaign. Ask him about his grandson who's getting bar mitzvah next week. That kind of thing. Call Joe Smith, um, he he helped get us Ohio in the election, and he's got a sick uh, wife, and, and you should ask about the wife. So it's a little, you know, six or eight calls, ten calls. Bill Clinton did that all the time. He was fantastic at it. And, you know, Ronald Reagan was very good at it, and George Bush was very good at it, too, George W. Bush. This guy never picks up the phone and calls anybody. I mean, anybody. And this comes, to, I think, to your point. And that's of, the amateur. It's the amateur and it's the arrogance, I think you refer arrogance, to. Arrogance, yes. But, but Ed Klein, I don't understand. Does it make sense? Here's the, you, you've got to have remarkable political skills to be the first black elected president in America, to do so while having leapfrogged, if you will, from a state senator position all that not that long ago. And this seems to be in direct con- uh, contradiction of, of those skills. He has certain kinds of political skills, which are skills in getting elected. He doesn't have executive a skill set to be an executive, which requires personal relations and an ability to persuade other people to do what you want them to it do. It reminds me of the entrepreneur who knows how to launch a successful business but can't run it. That's right. That's a very good good analogy. Think of Ronald Reagan. He picked up the phone at the end of the day, called Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House. Come on over to the White House. Let's have a drink. Tip, this is famous. Tip would go over there and have a drink with Ronald Reagan, big adversaries. Total, complete difference of opinion on almost everything. They tell jokes, sometimes off-color jokes. <laughs> They would reminisce about things. They would tell stories. They would have a couple of drinks, loosen up, and then Reagan or or Tip would say to the other, you know, uh, what do you need in order to go along on this this, uh, program, this bill? Well, I need such and such. What about you? you, Well, in order to get my people to vote, 
and they would talk about how to get things done. And they, neither of them was so arrogant that he thought that he had the final uh, lock on wisdom about anything, the way Obama does. He thinks he's the, the expert on everything, that, and that there's only one way to do it, which is his way and all the way. I get, Ronald Reagan would compromise, and so would Tip O'Neill, and they'd get things done. All right, my guest here is New York Times best-selling author of the book, uh, The Amateur. It uh, it it launches soon, right? What day is that again, Ed Klein? It's going to be this Sunday, the um, number one hardcover nonfiction book in America, and it will debut. As, let's let's sneak in a phone call. Uh, this interview went longer than I anticipated, but it's, it, I appreciate your time because I know it's late there. But this has been a great interview. Let's go to Don here in San Diego. Uh, it looks like Don wants to ask a question about Joe Biden. Don, welcome to the Rick Amato Show. Your question Thank for you. Ed it's Klein. A marvelous, marvelous book that you've written. Um, I'm, I'm kind of really looking forward to it. So my, my question is, you've been commenting on Hillary. Now, much was made about Joe Biden when he kind of came out of the blue when Obama picked him. The, the whole thing is that he would lean on him for po- foreign policy advice. Now, since... Since this administration, they're really known for not doing anything on foreign policy, of just laying back. Hillary has been a non-factor, not like Condi Rice was with George Bush, making a difference. And, and really, Biden's been a non-factor, too. They, they got lucky with, uh, uh, with Gaddafi getting killed. Can you comment on the relationship between Biden? Does he actually ask him for um, uh, advice, or maybe between Biden and Hillary? Or Thank you, Don. Great, great question, Don. Thank you. Uh, Biden... Hello. Yeah, Biden has been the voice of um, um, the voice that that I think Obama wants to hear. He's been in favor of withdrawing from Afghanistan. He's been in favor of withdrawing from Iraq. He's been against involvement. I, I don't think he was at all in favor of involvement in Libya, which we did, uh, and certainly he's not in favor of Syria. Hillary is a little much. Much is not the right word, but it's certainly more hawkish than Biden. And um, I think that Biden and uh, Obama are essentially on the same page as far as, as far as foreign policy is concerned, which is this this leading from behind idea, this idea that <clears throat> we are no longer the leader of the free world. We're just one among many nations, uh, that we have to go along with what the U.N. Security Council votes. I mean, that's part of the reason we're not going into Syria now, because the Russians and the Chinese are vetoing any resolution to get tough with the, with the Assad regime. Uh, Hillary, I couldn't agree more with your caller. I think he's absolutely right. She's no Condi Rice. She has been, uh, somebody once described her as somebody who has scored a number of singles, but the singles have not added up to any home runs. And she hasn't scored any home runs in foreign policy. All right, Ed Klein, again, the book is called The Am-